Good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the Social Justice Forum. Um, my name is Gretchen Musicant, and I'm a member of the Social Justice Ministry team that sponsors these forums. The Social Justice Forum theme for this program year is investing in each other's future. Through these forums, we aim to learn about opportunities for engagement and action by Westminster members to help ensure all our neighbors thrive, to better understand the structures and systems that have failed many of our neighbors, and to explore ways we can work together to build better outcomes. Today, we're pleased to welcome Westminster member, Betty Foliard. She founded ERA Minnesota Equal Rights Amendment with the goal of expanding women's rights and economic security statewide and nationally. She will provide updates on the status of both the state and federal equal rights amendments and map out actions in, Minis in the Minnesota legislature and how people can get involved to advance equality under the law for all. Some of you may have memories of the Equal Rights Amendment being um, something of advocacy and discussion. I know um, this forum reminded me of uh, going with a, a friend of mine to Chicago to be in an ERA rally probably in the 1970s. And so this is an idea that uh, has been around and I'm so excited to hear about um, how it's playing out anew again. Um, before we get started, though, just a couple items. For those of you attending in person in the Micelle Room, uh, please raise your hand and we'll bring a microphone to you uh, so that all, including those on the live stream, can hear your question or comments because really they can't hear anything that's not in the microphone if they're online. And for those attending online, please submit your comments or your questions to the live stream chat and we'll be monitoring that and we will raise your comments and your questions in the room on your behalf. So with that, please help me in welcoming Betty Foliar. Thank you, Gretchen, and thank you everybody for being here this early morning. It's so nice to be here on a Sunday talking about equality. I, I said in my um, remarks that I sent to Phil that uh, my faith informs my politics. And I really do believe that we are all equal under the law, that we are all equal in the eyes of God. And another way of saying it is that we are all worthy in the eyes of God. That for me, that is my little mustard seed of faith. That's a strong part of it right there. So um, I speak from that vantage point. I'm an elder in the Presbyterian Church. My name is Betty Folliard. I am a former legislator. I served three terms, six years, in the Minnesota House of Representatives. I served in the office of Congressman Keith Ellison, who is now our Attorney General. I'll be mentioning something about his study last year that uh, went to the legislature. And uh, I've been a small business owner, um, owner of uh, co-owner of Strategy Partners, an organization, a business that uh, did business and, and political consulting. And I started ERA Minnesota in 2014 when um, we were working, at the time I was the, I was the chair, the first board chair of an organization called Gender Justice. Now some of you might know, are there any um, attorneys in the group here? Gender Justice is a, an organization, a nonprofit law firm that works on eradicating gender discrimination. And they serve about uh, uh, several states in the upper Midwest, and they have some partners that they work with across the country. Anyway, we put together a, um, a group of bills with several partners back in 2014 when I was the, the chair of the board of Gender Justice that was called WISA, the Women's Economic Security Act. And there were 15 pieces of legislation, and that year we passed nine of them. And we suddenly were at the forefront of protections for women in the workplace. And I said to a group of my 
Friends, an organization that I founded back in 2003 called the Salon of Current and Former DFL Women Elected Officials, I said to them, you know, we need to amplify this voice because suddenly Minnesota's on the front burner. And uh, I said, I just saw that there's a rally for equality in Washington, D.C., and I'm going to go to it. We should, you know, get some folks for it. And at the time, Senator Sandy Pappas was the president of the Senate, and she said, we should get a bus, Betty. And I thought, oh, great, she wants me to get a bus. <laughs> so uh, that summer, I raised the money for a bus, and I recruited 50 people around the state, a very diverse coalition of individuals from every congressional district in the state. And we went to DC. And that's where we discovered that there were all these people working on the Equal Rights Amendment, state by state and nationally. And we connected the dots. We came back. I said, so you want to start an organization? They said, yeah. And I said, Okay, let's name it ERA Minnesota. So that was the beginning of it. That's where we were born. Now, what you need to know is that the state ERA is not your grandma's ERA. And there are postcards right over on the table there that I want you to see, pick up, write to your legislator, and it has the new state ERA language. This is African American History Month, right? And, uh, and so I want to acknowledge that as I read this, because one of the things that we know, and I, I was in um, London back in September during the time when Queen Elizabeth had passed away and the whole country was in mourning. And having lived in Ireland for seven and a half years myself and lived in London for a period of time, I... Um, knew that the Irish weren't always that fond of Queen Elizabeth until she went to Ireland in 2011, and she was the first monarch from Britain to go to Ireland in a hundred years. You think, I lived there during the Troubles. I know, I know what it felt like. Uh, she went there, she went to the, um, to the, the graveyard of the Patriots. Some of you know the Irish Patriots who uh, were there. And, and, and she bowed her head and she said, we need to bow to history and not be bound by it. The same is with the suffragists. The same thing, that we need to bow to history. I stand on the shoulders of giants here when I talk about the Equal Rights Amendment but we don't need to be bound by it. We don't need to make the mistakes that were made in the first wave of feminism and the second wave of feminism. The third wave of feminism is all inclusive. Now, some people say we're in the fourth, I say third, um, but it's all inclusive, it includes all. And so when I read this to you, you'll hear what we are bringing forward this year to the state legislature. It says, equality under the law shall not be abridged or denied by this state or any of its cities, counties, or other political subdivisions on account of race, color, creed, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, age, disability, ancestry, or national origin. Now let me tell you something. Somebody said to me, well, Betty, I thought that uh, the ERA was about women. And then I want you to look at the words of this, because every single one of those categories has a majority women in it. Age, race, color, creed, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity, expression, disability, ancestry, national or origin, all of them. And what we don't have and what we haven't had throughout this history is the privilege afforded to men to have the protections under the law for our rights. So what are we looking for? We're looking for equal rights under the law. And we'll talk about that. Now, I'm gonna separate this out because I'm gonna be talking about two different 
ERAs. There's the state ERA and there's the federal ERA. Most of you are familiar with the language of the federal ERA. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of sex. So where are we today with the ERA? Today with the ERA, we have two bills in the U.S. House and U.S. Senate that have already be, been introduced in this biennium. And they are stating that the Equal Rights Amendment is now the 28th Amendment to the United States Constitution, and it needs to be published. Okay? How did we get there? Well, you all know the history, or some of you know the history. The history goes back a ways. I'm going to take it all the way back to 1921, when Alice Paul, the great suffragist, and Crystal Eastman, who later went on to co-found the ACLU, wrote the words of the federal ERA. Now, I'm just going to be focusing on the federal now, so think of it as on account of sex, okay? And uh, in, in uh, 2021, at the First Presbyterian Church in Seneca Falls, New York, the location where the first women's Con conference was in back in 1848. Um, she inter they introduced it at the First Presbyterian Church in Seneca Falls. So we have history here in this church of being right on the forefront of the Equal Rights Amendment. Then in 1923, it was introduced by a Republican congressman into Congress, and it's been introduced every single year since that's 100 years that the equal rights amendment has been introduced in congress 100 years don't tell me we're not patient right <laughs> don't tell me we don't persist you know there's always a new crop of women coming along and we will continue to do this until the job is done so let's fast forward you all remember 1972 both bodies of Congress, the, the House and the Senate passed the Equal Rights Amendment by a large majority. It had to be two-thirds of Congress. It was more than that. And it was sent out to the states for ratification. Now, when I talk about ratification, I'm going to just be talking about the federal ERA because it gets a little confusing if I use the same word for the state, okay? So we got to 35 states. But a, an arbitrary time limit was imposed on the Equal Rights Amendment. It was given seven years. It was, it was then later expanded to three more years by Congress. And by 1982, we had only achieved 35 of the 38 states, okay? And then this arbitrary time limit made it go away. Now, the time limit was put in the preamble of the bill, in the preface of the bill. It was not put in the language that passed through 38 states now. I say 38 states because since, since ERA Minnesota started working uh, both statewide and federally on e equal rights amendments, we've passed it through three more states. And you, a lot of you know that. It uh, passed in 2018 in Nevada, 2019, I think it was, yes, in uh, Illinois, and then in 2020, I was in the gallery of the Virginia legislature when it passed through Virginia. Now, there was a little sticking point there because now we were celebrating that we'd passed it through 38 states and now we had achieved all of the constitutional requirements for embedding an equal rights amendment into our US Constitution. Two weeks before, the uh, the bill the the bill in in Virginia passed. The Trump Bar administration issued a memo from the Office of Legal Counsel in the Department of Justice to the U.S. Archivist, who is our minister over there, who is he's he's at the time it was a man, uh, a, a librarian who is supposed to certify or publish amendments sent a memo over there saying you can't pass it because it died in 1979. Wait, wait. 1979 was the first deadline, but the deadlines 
are unconstitutional. They are outside of the Constitution, uh, outside of the language that passed. Now, some of you will say, well, wait, there were five states that rescinded their ratification after they uh, had passed it. We have super precedent on that in the Supreme Court because the 14th and 15th Amendment also had states that tried to rescind their ratification and, uh, and they were turned back by the Supreme Court because there's nothing in the Constitution that allows states to rescind after they have passed, uh, ratified um, an amendment. So there we are, we have, this is the 28th Amendment to the US Constitution. Uh, I even have a Constitution that has the 28th Amendment printed in it. <laughs> and, and so now we're battling this on three fronts. We're battling it in the courts. And just so you know, you know the, the litigation that we have has 20 attorneys general and 86 major corporations on it, including Google and Amazon and the NFL. No irony there. And, uh, and, and plus, I mean, these are the folks on our team, right? Plus 250 uh, women's rights and justice organizations across the country. Plus, who else have we got? We've got the Conference of Cities and uh, major um, international uh, constitutional experts on it, and, and that's in the courts. In addition, we're asking um, the current administration, specifically the President of the United States, to pick up the phone and call the archivist. It's now a woman, her name is Deborah Steidel Wall, and ask her to uh, go ahead and publish the Equal Rights Amendment because it is the 28th Amendment. Now, in Congress, in the last two biennia, the U.S. House passed a resolution that uh, said that the time limit is unconstitutional and the Equal Rights Amendment should be passed. This year, now it's 2023, it's a little different setup in the House and, and, and the Senate, however, um, we have lit uh, legislation that's already been introduced. And this is kind of amazing because it's been going like lightning speed now. Everybody's on board. And we've got Senator Cardin in the Senate and uh, in a bipartisan bill. And we've got Representative Ayanna Presley uh, as our two chief authors. And now we're gathering all the co-authors on it. The new bill says that the Equal Rights Amendment is the 28th Amendment, and it must be enacted, essentially. So that's SJ Res 4 and HJ Res 25. And you're not gonna remember these numbers. However, you can go online, and you go to eramn.org, that's eramn.org, and you will see the language of the bills, you will find all of the connections that you need, you'll find all the information that you need. So, uh, and you can help on this. You know, I said, I'm gonna tell you what you can do for action steps. Action steps right now, um, on February 1st, Ayanna Presley and Senator Car um, Representative Presley and Senator Cardin held a brilliant uh, press conference that went viral and announcing the rollout of their bills. And on February 2nd, uh, Senator Chuck Schumer, the majority leader, took to the floor, talked about the Equal Rights Amendment, said that they're going to have a vote on it. And the intention is to have a vote on it before April. What does that mean? Well, again, we've got, we've got um, a, a divided House and Senate at the, at the federal level. And so what can we do? Well, if the Senate passes an, um, a bill that says that the Equal Rights Amendment is the 28th Amendment to the US Constitution, that sheds a whole lot of light on things and a whole lot of attention on it. And, uh, and so we want that vote to happen. And so I encourage you to call Senator Schumer's office and say, please bring up the, the bill, we support it. Uh, call your 
uh, representatives, your, senator, your senators, and say we're behind it. Uh, and let's see if we can get it over the finish line because it will be the first time in 51 years that the U.S. Senate will have passed the Equal Rights Amendment. So that's kind of like we can get this done, but that's just rolling the boulder uphill, right? We're not there yet. We're not to the top. So let me just look here and make sure that I got all of my points on the federal ERA done. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned the numbers, SJRES 4 and HJRES 25. And yes, I did it. Okay. So I get to shift over now. Change, <laughs> change gears here now. Because the state ERA, why, do we, why are we doing both of these things, you wonder? Well, first of all, the state ERA, I mean, the state constitution governs the, the courts in the state. And there are state courts and there are federal courts. Oh, my gosh. Here comes a judge, and she's going <laughs> to, oh, <laughs> I'm just talking about the courts, Jane. <laughs> she's going to correct me, I know. No, no. <laughs> No, so I, we've got the federal courts, we've got the state courts, and uh, the state ERA um, affects, uh, will affect our state court systems and, and give strict scrutiny because now we will have the language in our state um, constitution. And I'm going to reread this because this is the new state ERA as of 2023. Equality under the law shall not be abridged or denied by this state or any of its counties, cities, or other political subdivisions on account of race, color, creed, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, age, disability, ancestry, or national origin. What that says to me, now again, this is language that passed through Nevada on November 8th. It, it is, and it passed overwhelmingly by 58% of their population. Um, <clears throat> what that language says to me is, what part of equality don't you understand? It says that, we, as we say on our, our website, we say, Equality has no qualifiers. And it's interesting because, you know, we had this Bostock decision in 2020, and this was a Supreme Court decision that uh, came out around Title VII, and the question was, does it really include protections against LGBTQIA and particularly transgender people? Uh, and the answer was, yes, it does. And that language in 2020 by a conservative Supreme Court was the language on account of sex, okay? It wasn't the, the, the whole uh, long list of, 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 of pieces on it. And on account of sex, Gorsuch, in his opinion, specifically said, yes, that includes lesbian, gay, and transgender people. So just so you know, even though the state ERA is all inclusive in its language, the federal ERA can be used in the courts to protect all as well, and it's been proven to do so. Uh, as I was the chair of gender justice, uh, I, I said, can we use sex to mean all? And the answer was yes, because you can use sex and gender in interchangeably in the law, and you can argue either. So now the state ERA. We have our bills all fresh and in, in the door at the legislature. And we have two kinds of bills. The first is a resolution to Congress to say the ERA is the 28th Amendment and it needs to be enacted, just as we talked about the federal ERA over here. And that uh, is, it's just a simple re resolution. It doesn't have a lot of power, but it does say that Minnesota says that Congress get your act together, okay, and pass the Equal Rights Amendment. So that one is um, Senate File 47 and House File 197. Our chief authors are Senator 
Sandy Pappas, and Representative Kristen Bonner. Some of you might know these people, so I'll just throw it out to you. Our state ERA, this language, our, uh, we've got two bills, one in the House, one in the Senate. They've been introduced. We've put in our hearing requests. We've been told that we're going to very possibly have our hearings in the Minnesota Senate on either March 1st or March 3rd. This also goes towards um, an action step I'll tell you about in just a minute. Because on March 8th, we're going to be at the Capitol. Okay, I gave you a little hint. Uh, <laughs> So uh, this language, um, our two chief authors are in the House, it's uh, Representative Kali Herr, and in the Senate, it's Senator Mary Kunish. And Mary Kunish passed uh, our state ERA back in 2019 through the House, and then she became a senator. And so she's got great uh, gravitas when it comes to this. Um, when we talk about the Equal Rights Amendment, there are those who are more impacted than others. Those who, going forward, will be more impacted in a positive way than others. And uh, I specifically talk about the communities of color because they have experienced more discrimination in jobs, in pay inequity, in sexual pregnancy violence, in uh, maternity uh, health issues, etc. Uh, and those are kind of the key areas that I believe that the Equal Rights Amendment will directly affect. And so when we talk about that, I'm going to give you some statistics here. And this is out of the Attorney General's uh, report that came out on expanding women's economic security. That's the report I mentioned earlier. <clears throat> and in it, let's see if I can get to it. He says that, I can talk about this forward or backward, but I like the way he put it, or the way it's put. Racial dis disparities persist, and particularly in Minnesota, particularly in Minnesota. Women make on average 82 cents for every dollar that men earned. Uh, uh, and specifically, at, in Minnesota, according to the, this recent studies, while white women received 18% less wages on average than white men, Asian American women received 25% less wages than white men, African American women received 40% less, and Latinas received 45% less. He doesn't have um, indigenous women in here, but I believe that's even a little bit lower than that. Um, and women here in Minnesota with a master's degree working full time earn $1,018 per year less than co a comparable man with only a bachelor's degree. So we have higher education and lower pay. So there, there are lots of ways we can look at this. You know, we can talk about child care. And when the woman is making a lower wage in the family, she's usually the one who has to um, move aside and, and, and give up the job to take care of the child because sometimes child care costs more than college, okay? Um, I, I've experienced, you know, a lot of these different things in my own life. I don't tell my own story necessarily, but I've experienced sexual violence, pregnancy discrimination, and pay inequity over a lifetime. So the Equal Rights Amendment, from my vantage point, and, and I'd love to hear if anybody can correct me on this, probably when it's enacted, and it will be enacted, believe me, <laughs> probably when it's enacted, it won't necessarily affect my life, because my, you know, I'm, I'm a senior on a fixed income, uh, and I've experienced the, the um, things that have held me back financially over the years or uh, taken me out, you know, taking care of my mother and my father at the, the end of their life, the caregiving, all of that, raising my children, et cetera. Um, but it will affect my daughter, my granddaughter, and all of the generations coming up, and all of the young women particularly 
today. Um, so uh, anybody who's in the workforce, it, it, it can have a positive effect. And we can talk about the, um, the symbolic nature of the Equal Rights Amendment, and symbols matter because the ring on your finger is a symbol and it matters and the flag that people will give their life for matters and the Equal Rights Amendment putting women in the Constitution as uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg said she'd like to see that for her daughters her granddaughters uh, that, that there is a symbolic effect of that there's also the deterrent effect of it that uh, now if there's only uh, currently, there's only less than 1% of rapists that are ever adjudicated. And, uh, and, and it might act as a deterrent if you know that, oh, you might actually get in trouble uh, if you rape somebody. That you might, there might be consequences in the law if, if, if you uh, sexually assault another individual. So um, what we're doing right now, and I'll tell you, and then I'm going to start wrapping it up so that you can ask questions. What we're doing right now with ERA Minnesota, um, March 8th is International Women's Day. And we are going to be there in force at the Capitol. As I say, our hope is that we have uh, the Senate that's going to be passing our bill through the Judiciary Committee either March 1st or March 3rd. And with a view, they're thinking about this because it's, in, it's also Women's History Month in March, uh, that they're going to really highlight this in March and maybe take a vote on March 8th in, in, in at least one of the bodies in the legislature. You all are invited to come. You're invited to come. And if you go on eramn.org, you will see the uh, place where you can sign up so we know you're coming and you'll get the information of where to go. And we'll be doing a lot of visibility and legislators' visits that day. Uh, and it's also the first deadline of, um, in the legislature that week. So it's a busy week. Uh, the first deadline ends up on March, March 10th. Okay. So now let me just kind of wrap this up. You see us working on the federal ERA over here, and you see us working on the state ERA, and uh, we've been doing this now for a number of years, and we've, we've, that boulder has been pushed forward uh, all the way to reaching 38 states nationally, statewide. There are 27 states right now in the country that have state ERAs. 27 states have state ERAs. And this is not something that's scary. The oldest ERA is in California. It's 140 years old. Most ERAs are 40, most state ERAs are 40 years old. 40, they are proven. They aren't scary. They're, you know, the apocalypse will not happen when the Equal Rights Amendment federally is ratified. And in this state, in this state, we are a ratified state. Remember, I talked about this, that kind of applying to the, the federal. But we have never passed a state ERA. So uh, we're in the minority of states. I mean, we're not doing that well on equality. Honest to God, we are not doing that well on equality in this state. And so this is a way of making it happen, of, of embedding equality under the law so that all citizens, when they are faced with having to go into a, uh, a court of law, are not judged when they walk in the door. And I think that's important. That's, that's kind of my visual on this. Uh, and so you're invited to come. Uh, I, I really strongly suggest that you pick up one of those um, postcards and fill it out and send it to your legislator saying, we support the ERA. We want you to champion it. I'm kind of done with you know people who just kind of passively support the ERA. We're at the point of let's get this done. Let's make this happen. So with that, I'm going to stop yathering at you, and I'm going to let you ask your questions. Thank you so much, Betty. This is more detail than I imagined, um, <laughs> and not. 
in, in a great way. I mean, there's just so much going on. Um, I'm going to start with a question about what is the process of a state um, amending the state constitution? Is it just a piece of legislation, or is there something else? This varies in different parts of the country. So um, Nevada just, you know, they passed theirs. They had to pass it through two legislatures, consecutive legislatures, and then they put it on the ballot, okay? And uh, New York does something similar. They now have passed a, a even more inclusive state ERA. It's new language. Um, and and so they've now passed it through two legislatures, so it'll go on their November 2024 ballot. In Minnesota, to answer your question, uh, we just need to pass it through one state ERA, I mean, th through, one st th through one legislature, and then it goes on the ballot. However, it's a high, higher bar line. Our bar line is higher because w you have to vote a, a constitutional amendment to get a yes vote. If, when you walk into the ballot box and, and you've got, and, and, and it's gonna be 2024, and you walk in the door and you just say, I'm gonna vote for president, and you check that box, you walk out, that's a no vote in Minnesota. You have to vote yes. So I don't think that our big um, campaign, our, our big selling, uh, our, our, our challenge is going to be to get people to vote for equality, it's just to get them to vote yes on equality. Do you hear that, the difference? That, that it really is important. We have an education piece that we need to take across this state to say, do not just vote for your favorite um, candidate. Be sure to vote yes on equality, because if you don't, it's a no vote. Thanks for asking that, that's a good question. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, so is there a question in the room? And then we'll, we'll check online. So please, uh, if you've got one in mind um, online, uh, let us know about that too. Right. <laughs> Betty, I actually have two questions. One is, with regard to the federal legislation, does this have to bypass the filibuster rules or, or not? And then the second question I have is, do you anticipate that the litigation involving the federal law will still continue? Yes, well, the litigation will probably be settled before there's a vote in the Senate, uh, just because it's been sitting there for a while, and I think, I, time-wise, I think it'll go first. But um, yes, the filibuster, it, that's the 60 votes in the Senate. And, and you know, it's everything. It's voting rights, it's, it's uh, a number of things that, that, that face that high bar line. However, we now have, uh, and we have had for some time actually, in the Senate, bipartisan uh, co-sponsors on it. Uh, and, and some of them are, are, are pretty strong on it. And there's the general, um, consensus that if you bring it in, they will vote for it. That obviously there are many senators who will not, but uh, we believe that we've, we've, you know, we've been working on this now for a number of years and working with Republican moderate le legislators. And, uh, and, and we believe that we can get it done. And, and, and if they vote no and go back to their district and run in 2024, um, they're, they're going to feel the effect of that. Uh, That's one thing that we found when we put the, I had a vote on our resolution to Congress. Actually, I think you might have been in the legislature then. It was 2016, were you there then? No, you were gone. Um, in 2016, we had a vote in the Minnesota Senate on the resolution to Congress. And the vote was 56 to 6. 56 to 6. That's because there are a lot, lot of particularly male legislators, because that's, it's primarily male legislators, who could not go back to their district and say, oh, yeah, I voted against women's rights, but it's OK. And you know, mom and grandma and auntie and daughters 
that just doesn't fly. It just doesn't fly. I wanted to mention something too, and this is, this is unrelated, but it's something I meant to, to mention. When I mentioned in, in 2023 that uh, it was introduced in Congress, it was introduced by a Republican congressman by the name of Daniel Reed Anthony. And Daniel Reed Anthony was the nephew of the great abolitionist and suffragist Susan B. Anthony. Isn't that cool? When I say we stand on the shoulders of giants, I mean, there are people who have done things extraordinarily uh, to, to get women's rights a little bit closer. Thanks for coming. Um, it may be a little unfair to ask you to articulate the opposition, but I don't think they're well represented here. Um, <laughs> and That's so true. And and why you know why it hasn't it passed and and while well, speaking more to today why what, what's the opposition going to be today, and yes. I will also say as a small businessman when I first heard about the Equal Rights Amendment, um, part of my concern was it's just another cudgel that um, you know if you terminate an employee, there's attorneys who are going to say well what can we sue for? It's just one more oppressive thing on a small business that is going to cause litigation and. Um, government agencies that are looking into your business? Fair question. I'm going to take the second one first, okay? Talking about small businesses, uh, the Equal Rights Amendment uh, will affect the public sector, not the private sector. And so, um, you know, you can uh, discriminate. Uh, I, I wouldn't recommend it. <laughs> And, and, and the fact that the Equal Rights Amendment is there will be a competition. Uh, I, get, I shouldn't say you can discriminate. It's just not true. But, you know, that, that um, it, doesn't, it won't control because the private sector has, um, you look at the, the language of the law, that, that, that it won't be the Equal Rights Amendment, um, equality of rights under the law shall not be an, denied or abridged by the United States or any state. So the federal ERA uh, particularly is, is, is very aimed at the public sector. The state ERA is this state, cities, counties, and subdivisions, you know, political subdivisions. That also doesn't include small businesses. Okay, let me get to your second question because this is, yeah, I kind of didn't mention the, the opposition. <laughs> Um, and there always is. It just gets smaller and smaller every year. That's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of it. There are more of us. There are more people who believe and have family members, as I do, who I don't want anybody to discriminate against. I, I want them to be able to go into a court of law and be treated as any other citizen would be treated. And I, and I speak from the heart. I have a, a gay son, and I've got a transgender grand nephew. And, and, and I, I just, I love my family, and I don't want them to be discriminated against. Um, but so the, the opposition. Okay, what it was was, you know, um, unisex bathrooms. That was a big, scary one. All I got to say is don't fly if you don't want to use a unisex bathroom uh, and <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. stay home. Uh, by the way, in your home, it's a unisex bathroom. I'm sorry. I, I mean, <laughs> okay. Um, so, so, so now, you know, the laws have changed and, and, and there are unisex bathrooms. Uh, gay marriage. All these things happened without an Equal Rights Amendment, but that was a bludgeon back in the 70s and 80s. Gay marriage, now we have gay marriage in the land. Um, uh, women in combat, oh my God. And there is women, there are women in combat now, and there are women at all, almost all levels. Uh, women can fight and die for their country and they still don't have equal rights. And you look at sexual assault in the military and it is appalling. It is appalling, and an Equal Rights Amendment will help to protect them. So those things that, that were so scary, you know, they, they talked about, what about the draft? 
Well, the draft is something that Congress has the power to change, and they almost drafted women in World War II. But they decided at the last minute, no, I guess we won't. Uh, and, and so at any time, that's, that's just something that Congress can change. Um, I personally am not opposed to the draft. I do believe in you know, um, having some kind of service um, component in that, so to serve your country in some way. Um, other than to train to fight and, and kill and die. But um, anyway, so those things aren't there. I would say the, the main thing is the issue of abortion. And uh, abortion, uh, it, the very word kind of makes a lot of people go, ah! you know, ah! You know, it's been vilified and, and, and made dirty and horrible and all of these things for a number of years. Um, however, if in, in 2023, uh, and, and it was proven in 2022, you say abortion and we win. Uh, you say transgender and, and scary girls in, in sports and we win because it's, it's, it's not fair to um, vilify any particular group within our uh, country. Um, and the pro-choice lobby is, is, is very strong. So um, in New York, they have new language that, that they are putting, that they put into their uh, state ERA language. And it's, they added the words pregnancy outcomes and pregnancy and uh, reproductive healthcare, and that covers it. One thing that people don't necessarily realize is that miscarriages, uh, um, by definition, are an abortion. They are a naturally aborted fetus, you know? And uh, there are people in the last two months who tried to um, pass a law that, that says that uh, miscarriages should be criminalized. You know, and it's just like, we are not we are not vessels. Not every woman is going to have children. Not every woman is going to want children. Not every person with a uterus is a woman. We have to we have to look at the spectrum of sexuality here and understand that it's it's a bigger picture. So that's that's the big uh, push. And um, the Equal Rights Amendment has never expanded abortion accent access never has it expanded abortion access but it has been the the offensive line for states that have a state era to protect our rights against anti-abortion uh, le le legislation and litigation i hope that answers your question yeah other questions i'm going to just uh give a quick summary here because a lot of times people say, why do we need the ERA? Why do we need the ERA? Because women make 82 cents on the dollar with much, much larger inequities for women of color compared to men. Because twice as many women as men over the age of 65 live in poverty because two-thirds of minimum wage earners are women, two-thirds of tipped workers are women, because less than 1% of rapists will ever be adjudicated, because we're still fighting the battle of voting rights for all, because one in five college women and one in four in my, um, my university at Stanford University, one in four women, college women will experience sexual assault, because women still get fired for being pregnant, because childcare can cost more than college, because some bosses deny workers birth control coverage, Hobby Lobby, because we're one of only three industrialized countries in the world that have no paid maternity leave, because women can fight and die for their country and they still don't have equal rights, and because women are not willing to wait another 245 years for equality. So with that, I'll leave you and say thank you so much.
Yes. It is. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So, oops, um, I'm throwing it on the ground. I dropped the mic. Um, that was so good. <laughs> uh, thank you, Betty. Um, really brought me up to speed. And I know we had a conversation um, before we started. I was thinking my legislators are pretty much like-minded with me, and they wouldn't need any um, notification from me on this issue. But you reminded me that the process is uh, important as well, and that some of my, uh, one of my legislators is in a position to decide whether or not there'll be a hearing, and so needs a little prompting um, in that direction. So um, please, take a postcard, write something on it, and send it to your legislator. So um, thank you again for sharing your insights and your perspectives. Next week, we begin the season of Lent. And so the Social Justice Forum will be on a pause. And uh, we invite you as members of the congregation to join one of the Church in the Round discussions um, on prayer. And you can sign up for those uh, today if you haven't done so. And the Social Justice Forums will resume after Easter on Sunday, April 16th. And we look forward to seeing you then. <laughs>